what is it that you see on the internet with regards to relationship advice that was the most egregious? What were people getting most wrong that lit a fire under your psychology background? Um, I think what I couldn't understand is why we were pitting men and women against each other. I couldn't understand that battle. I didn't understand what positive outcomes could ever come from making men think women are users and abusers and they're awful and women thinking men are dangerous and aggressive and cheats. I couldn't understand um, where this anger and hostility was coming from. And more so, I didn't understand how it's going to benefit people by thinking like this. So I just wanted to debunk some of this kind of uh the zeitgeist to just kind of hate the opposite gender why do you think that has become so prevalent i think what's happened is firstly it's great for clickbait it's fantastic for like because lonely people are attached to what they see on the internet the most so when you're saying something that triggers the people that have been hurt they are going to share repost watch etc so when we tap into vulnerable people or people who've been broken and hurt we're going to get more views we're going to blow up quicker and easier so i think tapping into you know online success they want to divide and conquer that's always a, a best strategy the other thing is is that a lot of people actually haven't had relationship experiences especially the younger generation they haven't had that much experience so they learn a lot of it from watching online and watching memes and so on and so forth so i think it's become people's template they use the internet as a template for relationships if they been modeled it at home and as a result that's why they stick to the the information that they're getting online i tweeted literally just before we got started the cynicism safety blanket cynicism is a guarded response you're setting yourself up against disappointment its role within the system is to protect you against experiencing anything bad it is a preemptive strike against a perceived threat if i tell myself mm -hmm. that all women are bad, then I'm less likely to seek a relationship with women. And as a consequence, I'm never going to feel the pain of rejection. If I tell myself that everything is shit or that things will never get better, then I'm excused of ever having to try anything. It's more comfortable to get fatalistic and call it pragmatism. The cope is framing hope as pathetic and embarrassing and optimism as delusion. It's sour grapes at an existential level. If everything sucks and everyone is horrible and reality is disappointing and you know that for a fact, it's the people acting like things can be better that are dumb, delusional and the problem. The upside of never having to feel the pain of failure. That's a very impressive post, Chris. What can I say? Uh, my, point <laughs> being, my point being that I think if someone, we, we have a, a generalized risk aversion at the moment. Young people are getting their driving license later. They're having less casual sex. They're drinking alcohol less. They're taking fewer drugs. They are starting getting jobs later in life. Every, it's slow life strategy. Everything is getting pushed out because people don't deal with risk particularly well. And, you know, even if you're a Sigma male Jimmy Mo, it's still the same on your side too, that you're prepared to do hard things, but only within the bounds of what you consider to be acceptably hard. And yeah, this yeah. adversarial relationship or nature that's being sort of posited as men and women are each other's enemies, something that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing goes for, I guess, people just being concerned about, okay, what, what does the future hold? I will take yeah. all of my cues about this from the internet. Yeah, exactly that. What happens is, especially when we have low self-esteem, um, when we've got low self-esteem, the ego has to find ways to defend itself. We need to defend our ego because we don't have pure self-love and self-esteem. And the quickest and easiest way to defend your ego is by rejecting what may reject you. If I quickly say, oh, who wants abs? I don't have to go to the gym. If I quickly say, oh, God, men are trash. I don't have to work on myself to sustain a positive relationship. If I quickly reject what I believe will reject me, I then defend myself against the possibility of any kind of new trauma. So it's usually a trauma response, but really it's stemming from low self-esteem. And I, I, that's what it screams to me when I see these people who are trying to divide men and women and almost take pleasure out of insulting the opposite gender. I, I, I just never understood it. Shared hatreds are much more cohesive than shared loves. And mm. getting people to bind together over the mutual distaste of an outgroup is significantly yeah. easier than the mutual love of an in-group, which is why there are yeah. incentives online for creators to do this. 
Mm, exactly that. Because here's the thing, not every creator is trying to change your life for the better. Most creators are trying to sell you something, they're trying to get popularity, they're designed to polarize, they're designed to kind of make it online. And, uh, you know, and anybody could say the same for me, they're saying like, oh, you're trying to, you know, blow up and all this stuff, which I, 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 I hope people know that's not really the intention. But the reality is most creators are creating they're not actually healing and the problem is they appeal to the young market because there's a gap the older psychologists who understand all the academic references and all of those things they don't understand the young market of dating and because of that huge gap the young people are thinking i don't need to go to an expert i'll just go to this podcast with that guy and this girl and they will tell me because they get it they don't get it they just get you. They get what you're going through and want to manipulate your vulnerabilities in order for you to become a consumer of this. I've heard you say that current dating is just practicing for divorce. What's yeah. that mean? It means you're learning the tools and skills required to recover from a breakup rather than how to maintain a marriage. So you are learning how to make somebody jealous, how to move on quickly, how to meet somebody new, how to play hard to get, how to play games, how to essentially ensure your relationship will not make it through the tough times. You're not learning how to sustain and maintain and how to uh, debunk some of the behaviors in yourself that are toxic to the relationship. You're just learning how to uh, categorize every ex of yours as a narcissist but not about what behaviors or traits in you attract or even are narcissistic so i think the current dating climate is purely how do i move on how do i protect myself how do i not get too attached catch flights not feelings that culture is what we're being taught i guess this is similar to what we said before the risk aversion the guarded response exactly. mm -hmm. Exactly that. That's what it is. Well, I, I mean, in your opinion, have you noticed that as well? Like from a man's perspective? I mean, I've noticed it as a woman because I remember trying to share something positive about men um, and I couldn't find a meme online. I was looking and scrolling. I was trying to find something to show how lovely it is when you're loved by a man. And I scrolled for hours and hours and I couldn't find anything. But when I try and look for a meme that will say men are this, men are that within a second. And then that was my wake up moment because I was just like even if I wanted to say something positive about my partner I can't find anything online um, and then I realized that it is a culture of getting you to hate men is it the same in for men do you find that the same kind of culture is being trying to be breeded certainly in terms of men having distaste for women uh mm. you know like don't worry king you don't need her She's just a hoe in any case, you know, like Sigma, yeah. Sigma male memes abound. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. a lot less positivity from men to men, generally. Right. I think that there are still pro-women, women cohorts, yeah. but there are fewer pro-men, male cohorts. And, um, you know, that's partly just because of the trend. Yeah, everyone says, like, women will give their uh, give people compliments and not mean them. Men will take the piss out of each other and not mean it. It's yeah. that kind of balance. But it, it can mean, yeah. you know, think about Jordan Peterson, right? Why he came onto the scene so much. And he, he used to tear up all the time telling the same story, yeah. which was these men have never had a positive word told to them their entire lives. They've never been encouraged. They've never been told that they are worthy of love or yeah. acceptance or praise or validity or any of that. Yeah. Why did yeah. that message resonate? Because so many men felt and still do feel like no one sees them, that life can be hard, that they do have yeah. emotions, that they do want to open up, that they do need support, that they do want to be praised in a way. And because yeah. there is nothing deeper, I think, because there is still uh, a challenge in maybe men opening up themselves is the, some of the boundaries of that have been broken, but the boundaries of men responding to men that have opened up definitely still exist in a massive, massive way. So, okay, what Absolutely. are the ways in which I can get some validation from the world? Well, success, money, cars, education, women, status, prestige, dominance, yeah. aggression, yeah. you know, all of these, they're like proxies for what a lot of men want. And that's not to say I want all of those things as well, right? But they're proxies for what men miss, I think, more spiritually and, and existentially. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I feel like and in my work, when I've worked with men who have turned to um, prostitution and who have turned to pornography addiction, 
um, a lot of the time, especially when they turn to prostitution or even just a gold digger, um, they're so hurt when she doesn't like them back. So they're not paying for sex. They're actually paying for intimacy. And I always tell them, you can't buy intimacy. You can't buy it. This girl, you can buy her a bag and you can have sex with her, but you're craving connection. And that is something you can't buy. And the reason they're craving connection is because A, they don't know where to find it. And also they're being told if they do look for connection, they're a simp. That word simp gets thrown around. So we've almost shamed men for wanting and craving connection. And I can say in honesty, the men that cheat, the men that turn to pornography, the men that turn to escorts, I'm very non-judgmental because I understand behind every self-sabotaging behavior there is a need that has not been met for a really long time and for that need to be met they turn to self-destructive behavior as a coping mechanism so um, I definitely think that we've got a crisis of men cr seeking intimacy but believing that it's wrong and the culture and the internet is also teaching them that it's wrong so they're secretly craving it and then secretly finding uh, outsourcing it in the wrong ways simping for women is wanting emotional connection but somehow buying her a bag and flying her all over the world is not simping and that's the alpha male way to do stuff it seems like the bar still has been turned insane, upside right? down a bit yeah okay so, so you've, that, said, yeah. You've, you've said current dating is just practicing for divorce mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about the fragility of long-term relationships and divorce rates going up You've actually done some research looking at what predicts divorce. Mm -hmm. What did you find? Well, I, I have to give credit where credit's due, but the, the most long-standing research into uh, marriage and relationships was by the Gottman Institution. And they did the most scientific and objective analysis of relationships. And they studied 10,000 couples in a lab over a couple of days. And they were able to predict with 80% accuracy which couples would stay together and which ones would get divorced within a year. And it was so simple what they were able to find and it was simple thing as responding to each other's bids for connection what i mean by this is when we have a partnership where one person comes home and expresses an emotion the other one picks up on it that partnership has the uh, base levels to last a really long time so it could be a simple thing like you come home from work and say oh, i'm so tired and your partner says why what's wrong simple connection from that connection they trust each other and then they start to lean into each other but if you come home and you're like i'm so tired and your partner either says nothing or says why are you tired i'm the one that's been with the kids all day or what have you done all day i've been at work all day that turning away from each other's emotional needs is the training ground for divorce they are now setting themselves up for divorce and it might not happen today might not happen tomorrow it might last another 10 15 years but we get emotionally exhausted by having partners who reject our kind of advances for connection and eventually the relationship ends why is it the case then that divorce rates are rising if that's the biggest predictor if that's 80 percent accuracy of being able to predict why has that specific trait changed so much over the last 50 years distractions 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 there are alternatives to everything even if you want a meal you'll have 50 alternatives on uber eats you want to go out to eat there's 50 places that you could go you want to watch something there's 50 alternatives of what to watch there are so many alternatives to every single aspect aspect of life that it makes it almost impossible to invest in one everybody and everything becomes disposable. So what's happening is when your partner comes home a bit tired or stressed, it may be in the past you'd pick up on it, but now you're on your phone. Or maybe when your partner wanted to watch a series that you didn't care about, in the past you may have been like okay it's fine it's, I'll just get on with it there's nothing else on now like you watch this I'm going to watch that there's so many alternatives to everybody and every every person is now becoming so disposable that we can no longer have the patience to invest in people's emotional needs and we're becoming so hedonistic that our emotional needs come first and we're being taught this in society more and more we're talked to, we're always talked about put you first self esteem self assurance self actualization the word self is kind of programmed in our psyche and the collectivism that we used to have as a society is gone so we're no longer getting happiness from somebody else's happiness it's a, it's a selfish pursuit now unfortunately isn't it strange that the trait of 
focusing not on somebody else's re- desire for connection is causing you mm-hmm. to turn inward. That is causing divorces to increase down the line, which means that people respond to that by being more defensive, by being more guarded and more cynical, which makes them turn further inward, which makes them less of an eligible partner to the next relationship, which then just creates a cycle. That then gets broadcast onto the internet. People who haven't had much experience in relationships because they're young or because they fail out or because they're concerned or or nervous or averted to risk, use that as their proxy and say, right, well, I'd better enter into this relationship guarding myself so that I don't get hurt, which makes it more likely that it's going to break up and the cycle just continues. It's exactly that. What happens is we're actually entering relationships with our armor up. But in the process of playing those games, like not texting back, uh, not getting too close, not attaching, not telling them that you miss them, not telling them that you love them, you are training somebody to love you in the wrong way. If I'm somebody who's needy and I actually need lots of love and reassurance, but I don't want to text first and I don't want to be looking needy and I don't want to say I miss you because I'm going to wait for him, I am then teaching him that I'm cool, calm and collect and I don't care when I hear from him if I see you I see you but then he's under uh, he's not getting the training ground of what I truly want he's not getting access to my true needs so I am now no longer communicating effectively I'm actually teaching him how to love in a very avoidant and dismissive manner because I'm pretending to be cool when really if I say look I I need to speak to my partner on a daily basis I like to see you regularly I love you I miss you what is this I like labels when I start communicating my needs he will actually learn how to love me but we're teaching people to do the opposite. We're teaching people to pretend that they're somebody else and especially pretend that they're avoidant, pre- pretend that they're independent, depend that they, uh, pretend that they don't have these needs. So essentially we're going to attract the wrong partner. What else have you found that is a predictor of a toxic or a negative or a declining relationship? Uh, criticism over praise. Um, again, with the research, uh, one of the things that they find is partners that last are ones that praise a substantial amount compared to criticism. So they scan the environment to kind of praise their partner. They'll look for excuses to praise their partner. Like, even if it's as simple as like, um, you make the bed so good. Every time I come home, the house is clean. These tiny things, any opportunity to praise their partner. But what happens in relationships that end is they can't remember the last time they complimented each other they think it should be a given uh they think well you know i think you're pretty because i'm with you aren't i or you know i'm grateful that you pay the bills like uh, i'm I'm, you're a guy why do you need compliments men are craving this i've noticed a lot in in my practice the men that often have affairs they're not actually seeking sex they're seeking a woman that compliments them they say they can't remember the last time a woman told them that he looks great whereas for women we a partner says it but also our friends will tell us uh, people will tell us yeah we're, we're always being told we're beautiful or whatever it is uh, but for men if their partner doesn't tell them nobody does so when they meet somebody who simply tells them they look good they fit they they're intelligent something to validate them they immediately become attracted to that because they're starved of it so praise is something that i think couples forget how important it is I suppose that the game playing and the rivalry that sometimes happens in relationships as they start to go downhill, mm-hmm. that makes the situation worse because you're not going to praise somebody that you think is your rival or that you're trying to play games yeah. with or that you're unsure about the level of trust that you should put in them. Well, well whoever you don't feel safe with thing is all of these things that I'm saying they only come when you feel safe now simple things like liking other girls pictures or following people now makes people feel super unsafe super super unsafe so their guards go up I know people that the moment they add somebody on Instagram and they see who they're following they might have had a really great date with them everything was great but then they look on their following like oh straight away insecurities guards everything so we're now unfortunately in an environment where you're thrown into the deep end all your insecurities can now come alive through the use of social media so people are going into relationships ready for it to fall apart you've done a ton of work on trauma you've mentioned that word maybe a couple of times already i live in austin texas austin texas is the sort of place where when i walk into a sauna someone is talking about their trauma work that they've just done at an mdma and ketamine therapy assisted sound Mm -hmm. bath in south america and it's got me a little turned off from the word. I understand that trauma is a big deal. Yeah. I've had guys on that run psychedelic assisted therapy for PTSD for veterans. But mm-hmm. 
what is bollocks and what is not bollocks in the world of trauma? Where are people getting out over their skis? Where is it truthful? Well, here's the thing. There's trauma and then there's stress. Stress is situational. Yeah, it happens. You have a response to the stress, to what's going on and you're stressed about it. How you know something is trauma is their response is disproportionate to the scenario. That suggests that there is a pre-existing wound. Something's happened before you came along that's made them hypersensitive about the situation and their response is disproportionate. So whenever somebody's response is disproportionate to the scenario, there's potentially a wound. Now, I am personally of the opinion that uh, for me personally, all the holistic kind of things don't necessarily work on me. I wouldn't really go do ayahuasca and I wouldn't really be able to just do a bunch of affirmations. For me personally, that doesn't work. I, from, from my experience and personally, and I, I would love to hear what you, what you think as well. For me, the only way to outdo trauma is to make better decisions in life. Your trauma is kind of going to be always leading you to self-destructive paths. It's always going to lead you towards self-sabotage. Your trauma is going to teach you to live for today and not worry about tomorrow. It's going to tell you to spend the money in the casino. It's going to tell you to pay for that escort. It's going to tell you to just, uh, just indulge. But when you stop and you think start valuing yourself and making good, effective decisions, you're going to beat that trauma. That trauma is like a devil inside of you telling you to almost kill yourself through vices. But when you stop and you take control and you say, I am going to make good decisions, I'm going to take self-control, you defeat the trauma. All the other types of therapies, in, for me personally, I, I, I really don't like to knock anything because everybody's different. It doesn't work for me sitting in the mirror telling myself I'm amazing. It doesn't work. I can sit there and say, you're gorgeous, you're beautiful. I'm never going to believe that. But if I say, get to the gym, don't eat carbs for today. Don't eat sugars after this time. I don't care what my trauma is telling me. I'll start to feel more beautiful. But telling myself affirmations, it doesn't work on me. What about for you? What works well for you? Um, so I don't know with regards to the trauma thing, but certainly in terms of what makes me feel better, I have to change my mind with the body. So if I don't train, mm -hmm. if I don't get sunlight, if I don't move, if I get cold and hot within a day, I feel phenomenal. I went to a uh, sauna and cold plunge place that I love here in Austin called Kuya and mm -hmm. uh, took a bunch of friends from the UK there yesterday. And we did maybe two rounds of, of heat and cold. And you get out of the mm -hmm. cold tub after wanting your life to end for quite a while. And one of the guys said, dude, I challenge anybody that's having a bad day to do that and not feel amazing after you finished. So for me, changing the mind with the body is a good place to start. Trying to think your way out of overthinking is like trying to sniff your way out of a cocaine addiction. It's just not. <laughs> It's not going it's, it's to not make gonna work. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You're not going to find the solution there. And there's lots of research to suggest that as well. People think they get an anxious thought, they start thinking their way out of it, and now they're trapped with their thoughts and traumas. The reality is, I th most research shows that it's actually in your body. The anxiety exists in your body. So by changing your bodily state rather than your mental state will actually help. So, like you said, the uh, the plunges and the, so you take like cold baths and stuff like that. Would that work? And it Absolutely. works. Yeah, yeah, it does Incredible. for me. Incredible. It's the most yeah. it's the most reliable way to increase dopamine and then to keep it at a relatively good level before it tapers off. So most most mm. of the time there's sort of this uh, dopaminergic seesaw. So you will get some, mm. but on the other side you're going to pay for it. Kind of like going out and drinking and then you have a hangover. That's kind of how the dopaminergic system works. But yeah. cold exposure is one of the few things that allows you to get that increase and then it'll slowly yeah. taper back down to baseline without you having to pay this overdraft in a way. So it's a very reliable way to to improve dopamine. So t going back to the trauma thing, yeah. what are some of the common trauma patterns that show up in people's behavior? Or, or there's a mindset that many people may hold. Is there a common relationship between something that somebody believes and uh, a common trauma that has gone through in their past? Yeah. And, and I think one of the things people always believe they're far more unique than they are, especially in relationships. They always say to me, they get to a session, they're like, oh, you're never going to hear anybody like this. I have to tell you this. And I ask two questions and I can answer, I can tell them they predict their exact behavior. And what trauma basically is, it's not necessarily that you're abused or you're attacked or anything like that. Essentially, you had needs that were not met as a child. 
in some way, shape or form. And children, we're not designed to detach from our parents because we can't survive by being detached from our parents. So we won't ever stop loving our parents who don't meet our needs, but we do start love, stop loving ourselves. We stop investing in ourselves because we, we're thinking that we're not worthy of investment and it's all unconscious. So what happens in relationships is they go into the relationships with the preparation that this person's going to hurt me. So I have two choices. I either cling on to them for dear life and hold on to them and I can almost live in their skin and monitor their behavior and try and control everything they do and become preoccupied with them and watch when they're last online and just think, think, think about them all day, every day, just so they don't leave me. But in that desperate attempt to kind of keep them, we end up suffocating them and fighting with them to keep them and the relationship ends. Or you can go down the other route, which is to become completely independent, completely avoidant, dismiss, emotionally detached, emotionally guarded, and um, almost have a partner there, but act as if they don't exist. Have a separate room, don't get, invest too much, maybe have alternative partners here and there, and have the avoidant route, which I'm sure you've come across before. So we either go extreme anxiety or extreme dismissal and avoidance. And that is really the two trauma responses when it comes to relationships. When you're looking at trying to fix somebody's attachment, what are the places that you start at? Um, the first thing I always ask them to remember is your anxiety or your defense mechanism is not symbolic of love. What happens is people seem to think if they're preoccupied with someone and they're thinking about them all day, every day, and they're trying to control their behavior and they're watching them, I must be in love. I can't stop thinking about this person. I know he's toxic. I know he's you're not good for me, but I can't stop thinking. I'm watching when he's online. They mistake that preoccupation as love. They think I must be in love with that person when really, it's a signal. It's a signal to show that your trauma alarm has been activated. This person is not soothing you or you are finding the problems in this relationship. But either way, it's not a symbol, a symbol of love. It's a symbol that something's wrong. It's a signal that you haven't been able to soothe yourself or this relationship is not soothing. So we have to dissect which one it is. Is it the person or is it your own anxieties? So we start with their response. Or it could be a man that says, she's really great. I love her. She's done nothing wrong. She's perfect. But I don't really care about her. I don't really like her. I don't know. I need space. She feel, I feel suffocated. But when she leaves, I really miss her and I always get her back. But when she's with me, I always end up texting other girls that's still a, a trauma response. There's a part of you that's craving distance, but intimacy at the same time. So we look at it and we try and relabel the behavior because the avoidant will think I don't care. And the anxious will think I'm obsessed and I care too much. Both of them are defense mechanisms. That dynamic of the guy with the girl, when he gets the girl, it's too suffocating. And when yeah. he's away from the girl, he's wistful and wishes that he could get her back <laughs> is a dynamic that I have seen so, so many times. Why yeah. is that so common? What is it that's going on inside of the male brain that's causing that? Well, it would be. A lot of men think it's just the chase. They like the chase. And once they've got conquered, they no longer like the girl. There's an element of that. And that does happen. But majority of the time, it's when the man had emotionally distant parents. When the parents didn't take the time to truly get to know them and be truly there for them in terms of their emotional needs, what happens is they assume nobody's going to be there for their emotional needs. And the best way the ego defends itself is saying, I don't need anybody to be there for my emotional emotional needs. I don't need to talk about my feelings. I don't need to connect. I don't need someone in my space all the time. So they replace what they didn't get with what they don't want. And so when they meet somebody who's trying to emotionally connect with them, they label it as, I don't need this. Go away. Leave me alone. And they'll distance themselves, distance, distance. But when she leaves, they're in pieces. So they obviously do need it. They just don't know how to navigate this need with alongside their trauma. So they end up pushing away the very people that they love and are trying to love them. And they attract clingy partners. What happens is the avoidant person always attracts the clingy because if a distant uh, independent person met another distant independent woman, they don't have the glue to keep them together. So they also don't feel validated by somebody who doesn't care to see them. But when they meet that clingy partner, they get the validation that I'm loved, but then they don't have to put in the work because they know they'll, she'll love you and cling on to you regardless. So the clingy and the distant are always together. One of the other common archetypes I think that I'm seeing at the moment are people who continue to crave validation even once they're in a relationship. This is facilitated by social media, obviously, the fact that you yeah. can get um, 
let's say that you have an argument with your partner and then you decide to post a thirst trap photo or you mm-hmm. decide to start following a bunch of different girls. Is it cheating? Yeah. Uh, well, we don't really have any rules around relationships to say, you know, if you went out and had sex with somebody, that's definitely cheating. But this is yeah. more kind of passive aggressive global i'm just going to do it i've got an excuse if they do bring it up it's because of their insecurity they almost deserve it because we just had this argument and it's kind of there's a lot more degrees Mm -hmm. of freedom between in a relationship and out of a relationship and everyone can fuck about in the middle section there what is it or why do certain people crave this chaos within relationships and this sort of validation outside of them because they've lost touch with themselves. And what I mean by this is if I've had a fight with my partner and my instinct is to go message another man, am I doing it because I want like this other man and I want to speak to this other man or am I just trying to even out the playing field of this fight? Am I just trying to even out the score? Now, when you're so in touch with yourself and you love yourself and you go, what happens when you love and trust yourself is you go by what you truly desire. You're not trying to win a game what you truly desire. You don't post a picture online to get the to get comments because you're not in the mood. You've just had a fight with your partner. But when you're playing a game, it's game on. Every time you've annoyed me, game on. So when I speak to people and clients especially, they'll say, oh, you know, he's just been liking another girl. He hasn't called me in a couple of days. I'm going to go see my ex. I'm like, but just stop. Do you want to see your ex or are you doing this because you're upset he hasn't called you? Because if you want to see your ex, go ahead and do it. But if you're doing it because he hasn't called you, you are not connected to yourself. You don't respect or love yourself. You don't know yourself. You are going by what he's making you feel. But take back the control. Go by what you want to do. And if you want to see that ex, because you would do that even if this partner didn't annoy you, then listen to yourself. But if you, if it's purely to even out the score, I promise you, you're going to leave with shame and guilt. And shame and guilt are the two worst emotions a human being can feel because you direct that anger at yourself and it's, uh, uh, it chips away at our self respect. So I, that's why I think people turn to alternatives. They've lost touch with their authenticity. Are you from a Muslim background? I am, yeah. Okay. I am Muslim. I'm Pakistani. Pakistani, so we grow up Muslim. Yep. And grew up in the UK and now live in Dubai. Yes. Okay. Yes. Given <laughs> that very traditional, in some regards, mm-hmm. upbringing in terms of the values that you've been Absolutely. raised with, yeah. what are your thoughts and what are your insights around this current trend of um, applauding childlessness and demonization of motherhood that we're seeing coming from certain corners of women's advice at the moment? It's, uh, do you know what I have to say? It's so alien to me because when you are from my culture, our parents live for their kids. I, I, this is all we see. So what will happen, I remember when I used to go to school with, you know, my friends who are English and they'd say, oh, my mom and dad are going on holiday or my mom and dad are going to restaurants. And I'm like, my mom and dad don't go and do anything without us. They just literally, they, they just live for the kids and their money is saved for the kids' wedding days and everything is just like the kids, the kids, the kids. They, they center around probably too much around the children. So my culture was always like, uh, life starts when you have kids. What are you going to do our other than that that's what life is about and then growing up in an English world where it's slightly more do what makes you happy do what makes you happy now I think the balance is do what gives you a purpose now nothing gives you more of a purpose in life than when you have children because their sole existence psychological and physical depends on you and I'm not saying do it because you want to you know feel loved or anything but it's the only thing that will exist when you die so when you don't have children it's very difficult to see how all this loving memories and intelligence and experiences you've had and not be able to pass that on to somebody. Wouldn't you, if you've had a fulfilling life, want to then pass that legacy and keep yourself alive throughout the generations? And I think what's happened is we're so pleasure seeking that we the only thing that is guaranteed is death. And the only thing me and you both know is that we're going to have a funeral. Now, if on that funeral, there are still remnants of you that's a life that's a beautiful life and it's going to continue forever you don't truly die when you have kids but when on your funeral there's nobody but you got to travel 100 countries and you got to sleep with every man you wanted that day is going to come for all of us and that's the only day we're guaranteed 